But I think the odds do favor significant pain in 2023. And I do think that makes the Fed change policy. But I think markets are naively optimistic about how quickly or how little the pain will be before the Fed changes policy. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and this is the Miles Franklin Weekly Special for November 22nd through 29th, 2022, while supplies last. This week we have two great ways for you to stack silver ounces, kilo bars from the Nadir and Valcambi Mints. Our kilo bars are 32.15 troy ounces of silver. Both are 3.9s fine or 99.9% pure, and both are individually serialized by their respective mints. The bars from the Nadir refinery in Turkey are available at $3.50 over spot per ounce, while the Swiss Valcambi bars are $4 over spot per ounce. Both bars are LBMA approved and suitable for IRA storage. And if you'd like to learn more about a precious metals IRA, call us and we'll be happy to help you in that process. Our number for all orders is 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. And have a happy Thanksgiving. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is our good friend Lobo Tigre from TheIndependentSpeculator.com. Lobo, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me back on the show, Elijah. It's great to have you. And I wanted to discuss your recent changed view on the stock market. I know a lot of people out there have been calling for a continued crash in the stock market. We're seeing a rally here in the last month or so. Um, but you think, you know, maybe actually we aren't heading for too dire of a crash. Uh, what is your current view on the stock market right now? I think it's an important topic because I think there's a lot of, let me put it this way. This is the stuff you can make great clickbait headlines. You know, your market's going to crash or market's about to melt up, right? And, oh, click now to subscribe, all that stuff. Um, that's just not my style in the first place. But actually, I, I also hate being wrong. And you make these big, bold predictions, right? And, and then, yeah, it doesn't work out. <laughs> oh, well, sorry. Oops. Uh, I just think that's a disservice to the audience. So try to be measured here. Um, but sometimes you do get a sense that things are going in a certain direction. And earlier this year, um, you know, I, I just couldn't convince myself that markets had adequately priced in the impact of the Fed doing what it would have to do to even attempt to combat such high levels of inflation. Um, but to my surprise, I don't know. I wasn't wrong about the pricing in because things did head lower, but I was wrong about how resilient the markets have been because really the grind lower, you can't call that a crash. I mean, yes, stocks are lower. Yes, we're in a bear market. Um, that's not like a 2008 style event, certainly not 2029 or even a flash crash crash of 2020. This is a more of a relentless grind lower as investors adjust to the impending reality of what's happening. So when I saw the markets not melt down on some pretty hefty body blows, you know, when, when inflation went over 9.1%, right, and, and jumbo rate hike after jumbo rate hike and the market's still not melting down, well, the data says that the markets weren't as fragile as I thought. So I pulled that back. I did start buying again this fall. Um, and that's actually worked out pretty well. Uh, you know, had I not done that, I, my portfolio would be in a lot more pain than it is right now. Um, so I don't want to quote Powell on data dependency, but you, I, you can't get religious about these views. And, and going back to beating my drum here, I think this is part of the danger of these, you know, wild and extreme predictions in these bold headlines. Yeah, it makes, makes for a great YouTube video, Elijah. But it's so easy to be wrong. Like the more extreme your statement, like logically, like the more extreme your statement, the easier it is to disprove. If you say all swans are white, it just takes one out of all the millions of swans in the world that isn't to prove that you're wrong. So where does this leave us now? I have pulled back on the market crash thing, but make no mistake, I'm a bear on this market. You know, these rallies that we're seeing, I think these are bear market rallies. I think the odds actually favor uh, a long-term downtrend in equities. Like we saw a multi-decade bull really, you know, with 
volatility along the way since 1980s, in the early 1980s, when Volcker came around and did his magic mojo. Uh, we could see that be the next, you know, opposite turn heading downwards. And the good news for your audience and mine is that commodities and equities tend to be, broadly speaking, contracyclical. So in the same way that um, before Volcker, you saw commodities going up and stocks going down, we may see something like that again. It's not a promise. It's not a prediction. It's just looking at what we've seen in the past. And it certainly seems that equities in general around the world are, are ripe for a pivotal turn. And you look at what's going on, you know, not just the COVID lockdowns and the knock-on effects, but the war, the new Iron Curtain, the deglobalization trend, uh, you know. These people that think that inflation is going to go down to 2% by the end of next year, not just eventually or someday. Like there's analysts out there on Wall Street saying that inflation is going to go down to plus or minus 2% by the end of this coming year, Elijah. I think that's absolutely delusional. Um, so there's many ways we can go from there. But make no mistake, I'm a bear on broader equities that actually, despite the recession scare in the near term, potential headwind for commodities. That actually makes me pretty bullish on commodities. I think the inflation is going to be very sticky, even if it doesn't stay as high as it has been. You know, it. one last thing, people can peak inflation, peak inflation. Keep, I have a cartoon on my website about this, where there's a guy, he's standing on the shoulder of a mountain, right? There's people climbing up the mountain. He's standing on the shoulder. He's looking back down at them and pointing at the shoulder and saying, it's peak inflation. And the mountain continues rising behind him. So this is really important, and you just don't see this on mainstream media, that a decrease in the increase is not a decrease. It's still increasing. Nobody's cost of living is getting any cheaper. Stuff is not getting cheaper. And the raw materials needed to make this stuff, I think we will see higher prices in due course. Now, when it comes to how the stock market has held up amid, you know, as you mentioned, these big blows to it with the uh, high inflation and the rate hikes, um, why do you think it's held up so so well? <sighs> Popular delusion might be hard to, to puncture, but no, I mean, let's not be snide here. The reality is that an entire generation of traders has been trained to think that the Fed has their back. And that the moment anything goes wrong, the Fed will come to the rescue. And the Fed's saying, no, no, no. And it's amazing to me how many grown adults there are out there on TV, YouTube land saying, oh, well, the Fed keeps saying that you know, they're, they're not going to bring the punch bowl back. Yeah, that's what they say. You're going to believe everything they say? Like, <laughs> um, you know, not on this planet. Of course, they say what they think they have to say. They didn't make it true. So investors have been trained, however, that the Fed will come to the rescue. I think it is reasonable to question how quickly and how much they might come to the rescue when they're trying to battle high inflation, which they haven't had to do for a long time, or at least nominally as reported by the government inflation. Um, but the Fed does have a dual mandate. And at some point, right, the pain of the cure, the supposed cure, uh, does get people out in arms, and I do think that I do actually think that the market is right to expect a pivot at some point. I think they're dead wrong to expect it too quickly, too soon, and this conflation of a pause while they, you know, pause to see what the what they've already done and what the consequences are of that are, to equate that to a pivot is obviously a mistake. And to their credit, some of the talking heads on financial media are saying that. But the attitude seems to be one of conflating these things. And I think there's actually uh, significant odds of a substantial bear market rally once that pause starts to become reality. And this could happen as early as a couple of weeks, Elijah, if in the Fed, um, you know, FOMC decision on December 14, if they go with 50, that's still a large rate point increase by normal standards. But it's not as much as 75. And if this is, oh, this is the beginning of the end of the pain, right? I could see the markets reacting, let's say, in a silly way to that news. Um, plenty of dust ups to come. But at some point, I do think the Fed will pivot. There will be real pain. The, you know, 
people are uh, on mainstream media, you know, not, of course, on liberty and finance, on mainstream media, look at all these talking heads out there, and they're all talking about how quickly inflation is going to come down and how the Fed's going to pivot and all that. I, I do think they're pretty delusionally optimistic in most cases. Um, and uh, give you one last key point here. I think the Fed has probably already done too much to avoid a painful recession. I think mild and you know short recession, not in the cards. Uh, <laughs> the idea of a soft landing, totally out the window. And this... <sighs> <laughs> just uh, for whatever it's worth, um, you know, it, and, and that's not to say that they shouldn't cause a recession. I mean, when you have excess, it needs to be reined in. I'm not saying that at all. I, I actually think interest rates should be left up to the market, not in the hands of polit politically appointed bureaucrats. But, you know, the balance sheet, which most people are ignoring, they are actually tightening more than I thought. That's another one. I'll do a mea culpa one. I didn't think that they would tighten as much as quickly as they have. Uh, almost 400 billion um, since earlier this year when they did start doing that. That's really significant. Uh, you know, some people say each one of those is worth another rate hike, and that's on top of the rate hike. So um, long and variable rag lags, Elijah. What the Fed has already done, uh, I think, probably ensures serious pain in the year coming ahead. So this isn't a a someday kind of maybe kind of forecast. You're, I'm out on a limb here with you, Elijah. You know I don't like making these big, bold predictions. But I think the odds do favor significant pain in 2023. And I do think that makes the Fed change policy. But I think markets are naively optimistic about how quickly or how little the pain will be before the Fed changes policy. Now, in this environment of, of great pain for the markets, um, what do you expect for the precious metal sector and the commodities, commodities in general? I have uh, pretty different views on those two pieces of your question, Elijah. I'm absolutely not buying any industrial metal plays at all right now. Um, even copper, which you know, I think of copper as something that's you could you know buy the best stocks and the companies that are you know strong going concerns and just stick them in a drawer and not worry about them from years and they'll probably do fine. Uh, but that doesn't mean they won't get a bunch cheaper in this foreseeable probability that I'm describing. So even those, even though I like them, even though I think if you bought today, you'd probably come out well over the years ahead. Uh, most people don't have the intestinal fortitude to take a 50% haircut from that point before you go on to payday. Uh, but even if you could, if you think that's what's likely, why not wait for the 50% bargain? So I'm not buying any industrial metals at all right now, um, even the ones I like. And... Let's see how bad the recession is. Let's see if I'm right. You know, if I'm wrong, what are the odds that, you know, copper and iron and all this stuff is just going to take off tomorrow? You know, it's going to double within the next few months. I think the odds of that are very, very slim. Never say never. Could happen. I could be dead wrong. But I just that just seems very unlikely to me, whereas lower prices ahead seems quite likely to me. So willing to do that. Of course, Gold and silver, monetary metals, a completely different thing. You know, I don't like to say precious metals because just because something is expensive that doesn't make it a monetary metal. Nobody can tell palladium from platinum or silver. You know, nobody's going to circulate palladium coins because nobody knows what it looks like, right? It's just one of these silvery metals. So precious is not where it's at for me. Monetary metals have a significant different, excuse me, significantly different uh, it may seem like a stretch to word, use the word reality, but there is a psychological reality attached to monetary metals that have been used as coinage, as money in circulation for thousands of years. That does mean something. That is real fact history. Um, and as your audience, I'm sure, well knows, silver is the money word for money in many languages. So um, turmoil, pain, that can create a lot of safe haven demand. For the traders out there that think of gold and silver as just another commodity like pork bellies or copper or something like that, and bear in mind that these are most of the people that trade on the COMEX and the LME, they think that way. They're not like you and me or our audience out there. 
um, you know, they don't go down to the local coin shop and admire the beauty of a, of a rare, you know, buffalo gold <laughs> coin or something, right? Um, they th view these as commodities. So there is potential for noise. We see it all the time. You, you, the day-to-day -day correlations look wonky. You look at the high correlation, uh, sorry, the low correlation between gold and inflation over the last year, and it seems like gold is broken. But all of that is short-sighted noise. If you pull back to the big multi-decade picture, there's absolutely no question that gold is the best inflation hedge in history. It still remains that way. And I still see gold and silver as monetary metals. So the traders may react to the day-to-day -day noise in ways that don't make sense to you. But the reality is that um, safe haven demand still applies to monetary metals, gold and silver. And there's a very good chance that we'll see that regardless almost of what the inflation situation does because of all these other things, not to mention a hot war happening in Europe and <laughs> fear of recession going on. One last thing, though, too, is that, <clears throat> as I said, I think inflation will remain higher than, than the optimists expect. And as that expectation sinks in, that really changes things. I think you and I have discussed this before, that the big difference between the stagflation of the 1970s and what we're seeing right now, for gold and silver at least, is that back then everybody, but everybody knew that prices were going higher. Everybody was talking about you know, loading up on anything that you could, durable goods in particular, before prices went up. And people were talking, they'd brag at a bar or at the shoeshine boy about the last you know, gold coin they bought or silver. As the shoeshine boy, I was buying silver with my, with my you know, lawnmower money and that sort of thing. Um, because everybody knew that prices were going higher and that gold and silver were a hedge. So I think there's a chance for that to happen, um, not just a chance, I think that's likely to happen at some point in this inflationary cycle. And that could, the chances that that could take off in 2023, not too distant future, Elijah, if those inflation expectations start coming back as they did in the 70s. Uh, that's a key data point that I'm looking for, and it will inform a lot of my writing going forward. That's a very interesting distinction that you bring up because, yeah, as you mentioned in the 80s, everyone knew that prices were rising. But right now, as you mentioned earlier, the expectation is for inflation is that it'll be back down to 2% by the end of 2023. It's like as soon as it becomes apparent that inflation is not coming down, that's when the run to gold starts. Is that is that your view? Nothing is ever that simple, but I do think that will be a major driver. When, when people start realizing, you know, holy cow. It's the inflation is not going away. And of course, all the peak inflationistas out there, they'll be talking about, oh, look, it's down to 6%. Oh, look, it's down to 5%. This is great. Woohoo, the Fed's beating inflation. 5% inflation is not great. 5% inflation destroys 40% of your savings in just 10 years. Compounded inflation is a horrific thing. And most people outside the United States know this. Um, I'm afraid Americans are about to get a reminder lesson in this. So, yeah, this this reality sinking in, I think, is a game changer that look forward to is maybe not the right thing. You know, I don't want to be guilty of schadenfreude here. It will do well, I think, for my investments. But it's going to it's going to ruin a lot of people. Elijah. It's going to cause a lot of pain. So can't say I'm looking forward to it. It's something I'm preparing for, though. And when it comes to the other commodities, I know you were recently on a podcast with Rick Rule, and uh, you were all talking about how the reopening of China, um, that could uh, have an impact on commodity prices. It sounds like, though, you're still somewhat bearish for the short term on industrial metals. Can you expand on your thoughts on how the reopening of China will impact prices? Right. OK, well, two points. One is I'm short term bearish on industrial metals, partly because of China. And we'll get into that. And partly because of recession, which we already talked about. And, you know, there are many clever articles out there about how this time is different. <laughs> you know, famous last words. Right. And why, you know, the prices will remain elevated even in this, you know, supposedly mild and short recession we're going to get. But the data tells me otherwise. The reality is that as the awareness of recession, you know, from a threat to an actual happening now trend happens. It's always bad for commodities, Elijah. They, you know, even the ones that are in short supply, the traders don't care and they sell them. 
Um, we, we've seen this before, and I think we will see that again. Now, as far as the China question, I'm actually very bullish on this, and I'm glad you brought it up. But I want to make clear that my bullishness is not immediate. Like there's been so much hype and excitement because China's been changing its zero COVID policies, even while insisting that it hadn't changed anything. Um, but that doesn't mean that China's really going full bore into the great reopening right now. That's not what's happening. As you and I speak today, the news is new lockdowns in China affecting even with the changed policy, it's supposedly more targeted. We're not going to lock down whole cities or provinces now. We're going to try to focus on neighborhoods, maybe even blocks, you know, narrow down to one block you can't leave. Um, despite these changes, uh, the current lockdowns, the, the deaths that they're admitting to are close to, um, well, that they're admitting to deaths at all. Is, I'm sorry, the number of cases is close to record levels right now in China. It is November. We're going into flu season. Um, so it's not surprising that they're struggling. I understand that about 20 percent of China's population right now, as you and I speak, is affected by these restrictions. So, <laughs> um, you know, that's not bullish in the near term for commodities. On the other part, it's it's also not as deflationary as people expect because there go your supply chains again. Everybody keeps saying, oh, yeah, yeah, inflation is going to come down because we're fixing the supply chains. Well, not so much, not so fast. Of course, people are retooling and moving away from China. But, you know, these things take years. They took decades, these supply chains, to build up the way they were for just-in-time inventory and super cheap Asian labor. Uh, retooling away from that, it's very much a work in progress. So what I'm saying is, that you know, the reality is that you can't have your economy locked down forever or you have no economy. Reality matters. China has to reopen at some point or it will no longer be China. It will no longer be the manufacturing powerhouse or the world's second largest economy. You, know, the, it's, you just can't do that if you destroy your economy. So I, I do think reality matters. I do think we're seeing the... Communist Party of China acknowledging that with these small baby steps that they've started to make. But I don't think we see major changes in a, in a larger reopening until after flu season, at least. So probably in the spring. So I'm an optimist, but not right away. So between that and the reality of the global recession starting to slap traders around over the immediate like weeks and months ahead, I, I'm very cautious about uh, the industrial metals. So what in your uh, perspective, I guess, will change this then? If you're looking at the industrial metals, what do people have to be looking for to have that flip? Because as you mentioned, if you're looking to invest in industrial metals, why not wait uh, until they're cheaper? So what do people have to be looking for for to, you know, maybe not pick a bottom, but be close to it? Yeah, right. Um, my, my saying is, you know, Queuing on Doug Casey, don't try to catch a falling safe. My saying has been, you know, yeah, you, you can't catch a falling safe. Just let it smash. Let it hit the pavement. You know, it'll smash. Bags of money will go all over the place and then pick up whatever looks interesting when the dust has settled. Now, you, you'll miss the bottom. I have absolutely no interest in trying to catch or time the bottom. That's a fool's error. And I think any savvy investor knows that. It's not a new revelation from me. Um, but at some point, it'll be pretty clear. I think at some point, recession will be priced in. It'll be now. It'll be a reality. You can see it around you. It won't be fear of recession, Elijah. It'll be headlines about how bad the recession is, right? And then as those start to turn up again, or as, or as it seems like the pain has maxed, I think that is a reasonable time uh, to start looking at what the safe has left smashed around on the pavement. And the other one will be China. I think that will be more obvious. Uh, China's taking more significant reopening steps will be, I think, quite visible, and the consequences will be highly visible. You know, China might phrase things. I don't think they're ever going to admit the zero COVID policy was a mistake. They're just going to move the goalposts. And, you know, what zero COVID means or the different variants or something, I don't know. They'll, they'll move the goalposts, Elijah. So it's not like the Chinese government will put out a press release. We've reopened and that's our cue. But we'll see them move the goalpost. And you'll see probably first in Hong Kong and Shanghai, you'll see the Chinese markets react. 
and that'll be a cue. And then we'll see it in commodities prices. All right. Well, Lobo Tigre, we really appreciate your time today. Before we let you go, where can our viewers find you and any last thoughts you'd like to leave with our viewers? I'll make it easy. Independentspeculator.com. We have a free weekly newsletter that if you sign up for, I promise we will not spam you with a flood of daily advertisements. I hate that stuff. As for final thoughts, I would say there is one exception to the industrial mineral side, and that would be uranium, which you and I have talked about before. I won't wax rhapsodic about that now. But while most other commodities have corrected and most markets are down this year, uranium is one of the metals that's up. Uranium and lithium, by the way. Um, But while lithium is near all-time highs, uranium is still below the cost of production. I think that's extraordinary. I think that's durable. I think the world has caught on that there's no way it can meet its uh, very aggressive green agendas, uh, you know, targets without nuclear power. So I'm extremely bullish on uranium. And there are great uranium stocks right now that are relatively on sale. So I do see opportunities there right now. Fantastic. Once again, Lobo, thank you so much for your time and God bless. Thank you, Elijah. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A-plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we will let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be double boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly, with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Elijah, my brother Kaiser, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.